Hi everybody, very happy to be live with our second panel of the Cozy Crime Festival today. Um, I have SJ Bennett and Hannah Hendy, who are going to start off by giving us a quick introduction to themselves and their books, starting with Sophia, do you prefer yeah? Yes, absolutely, thank you very much. Um, hello, um, I am the author of the Her Majesty the Queen Investigates series, and I've got the latest book behind me here um which is called murder most royal um and the series started with the winds are not um which is set in 2016 and if you haven't come across it uh the 90 the queen who is about to turn 90 um has to solve a rather salacious murder at windsor castle and everyone's trying to protect her from it because they think she'll be too shocked she'll need her smelling salts but in fact she's the most competent person around to solve it um, and it turns out that she's been solving crimes since she was 13, all secretly. So um, she's very good at it. Um, and in The Windsor Knot, she has a new sidekick called Rosie Ashodi, who is a Nigerian Londoner and uh, an ex-captain in the British Army. Um, and Rosie begins to, um, to learn what the Queen's up to and help her out. And this book set in Sandringham. Um, they've kind of formed a, a team by now. And so the Queen is there for Christmas in 2016, 2017. And um, and Rosie helps her solve yet another murder. So yeah, that's my series. And Hannah, uh, hi, I'm Hannah Hendy. I'm the author of the Delayed Detective series, which is um, so I've got three out now. The last one just came out on Thursday. Um, so it's about a married uh, couple, Marjorie and Clementine, who work within a Delayed team and solve murders that seem to be happening to them. Um, and the newest book that's out that came out on Thursday is A Terrible Village Poisoning, which I've got here. And basically they're on holiday. And again, another horrible murder happens and they have to struggle to try and work out who the murderer was. So that's about it, really. Let <laughs> <laughs> them kind of bumble their way through. <laughs> so you've both been invited to take part in our Cozy Fest. So I thought the first this question I would throw out to you is what you think cozy crime is yeah i must say i've had to think a lot about this um because uh, winds are not came out in 2020 um at around the same time as thursday murder club and suddenly cozy crime kind of took off like a rocket i mean obviously it had always been there but you know people were talking about it a lot more and yes lots of people are asking what exactly is it um and I mean, I think um, a lot of people would would sort of say that uh, there there is generally murder, as there is in so many things. But it tends the violence tends to be off the page, um, so it can take place in all sorts of different settings. But what, whatever setting it is, the setting is generally quite important. Um, and there's often some humour to it, and a huge range of detectives. Some are professional, some aren't like, um, like ours, um, and there's hints of violence but it's not going to be horribly graphic. Um, and you have a sense that it's kind of going to turn out all right in the end. Yeah, I always kind of feel like there's going to be a happy ending. You know, nothing too dreadful is going to happen. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like we, we disrupt a nice. lovely world that we've created and then we... Yeah. <laughs> like throw them to the lions and then bring them back out. Yeah. Alive yeah. on the other side. <laughs> How do you feel about being in that genre, though? Because some authors really embrace being like a cosy crime author. Some people don't particularly like sort of being put into that sort of category. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you know when I I wrote this um, over a couple of years because uh, I don't have an age. I didn't have an agent. You know, I wasn't. It wasn't planned. It was just I was just writing, and that's just how I write. <laughs> So I'm like, well, embrace it. That's who I am. Um, and that's what comes out when I sit down and write something. So <laughs> I think like at the moment, like Sophia said, there's this huge cozy crime resurgence. And I feel like I was very lucky that I caught the wave at the right time. And it all just kind of seems to have worked out. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm the same in terms of that's what I write. If I tried to write a real hard boiled thriller, it would come out yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, I don't like the word cosy. I think it's really unthreatening. And I think we all have things in our book. Oh, got frozen, Sophia. Oh, no. She may unfreeze. Hopefully she will. 
in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> <Tech problems. laughs> yeah. We have tech problems. We might have to drop Sophia out and let her drop back in. Oh, no. If it stays frozen. But um, how do you find the research for yours? I'm going to ask Sophia this as well because I'm going to imagine it's quite challenging for her. My Google search history is horrific. I'm sure I must be on a list somewhere. <laughs> I'm writing, so I'm writing, um, I've just started planning, like plotting the fifth book and um, like I had to kind of school, I had to do a lot of research on decomposition of like bodies that have been in water and I was just like oh that's horrible and then <laughs> and I had to look up for the third book uh, that's just come out I had to look up a lot about poisonous plants which is really interesting and also I'm a chef so foraging and stuff that's you know we love food so um it was really interesting but also at the same time it's like some of the things that are horrific you know um, yeah I've just um been reading Rosemary Schrager's book and in her first one there's a lot of like foraging and sort of discussion of poisonous plants it's was really interesting yeah um, I kind of had the idea for it I was doing a CPD day for um a job I had and uh the chef was talking about like all the foraging that he does and all the poison stuff it was so interesting and that just kind of sparked the idea like oh wow what if they go on holiday and um that is what happened so <laughs> got Sophia back she's here hello hello sorry about that yes my my um wi-fi has decided to come and go so <laughs> fingers crossed it hasn't done that before there we go that's the way of these things what have I missed I was just asking about research because I think for both of you because we've got dinner ladies and the queen that the research must be quite challenging I always fear it. <laughs> I think, oh no, it sounds like really hard work. And then I absolutely love doing it. I do masses and masses, way, way, way too much research. And I like <laughs> to think that my books are much more accurate than The Crown. I mean, they just are. More than the crown. Um, I the think dates so. Are right, the clothing's right, the people are right, the background is right. I don't have to film it in other locations and all of those things. Um, so yeah, I love doing it. And the book I'm writing at the moment is set in 1957. So I get history on top of um, the actual kind of locations and things. And yeah, I mean, for me, that's, it's, um, it's, it's the really fun part. It gives, it gives the stories their life. I think the plot's one thing, but yeah, filling it out with all the amazing details I find out, like, you know, um, tunnels under Buckingham Palace. So the fact that there's a swimming pool that was kind of built for the Queen and Princess Margaret and what she liked to eat, everyone's always fascinated by. And the fact she had a real weakness for chocolate biscuit cake and she used to get really <laughs> cross if, um, if there was a bit left and it wasn't kind of put in front of her the next day. And yeah, I love all those details. That's really cool. Because I was like, when I was thinking about this before, and I was like, but you can't really like visit those places, can you? You can't really go and visit a school kitchen, and you can't really go and visit like <laughs> the sort of back scenes of the palace, um, to to kind of get your positioning right. So I guess there's a little bit of a suspension of disbelief as well. Yeah, I mean, I, there's bit, all behind the scenes stuff I I have to make up. I can ask some people just to make sure I've got it roughly right, but they're they're very sort of protective of the royal yeah, privacy imagine. which I respect yeah. so um yeah but you know it's fiction I, I have to remind myself that I'm not actually doing a documentary it is fiction I'm allowed to make things up that's okay that's true um you've both got kind of slightly older characters do you think that's the thing that we're, we're meant to be talking about the variants in cozy crime um do you think that's one of the joys of like cozy crime that we can have kind of I feel like cozy crime's got a lot of female slightly older characters if you look at yeah. <laughs> really big cozy crime authors a lot of them are female you know it's really interesting I don't know a lot of the murders tend to be like poisonings rather than like brutal violence it's not ever very graphic it's always kind of like someone's fallen off something or it's interesting I mean, I think it can be. I, I have um, I have somebody who is. Uh, it looks like autoerotic asphyxiation in my third. Yeah, line, yeah but which, I, is, which is not non gruesome, <laughs> but you know, I don't go into massive detail. Um, but it, I mean, it's true about there being so many women. I mean, I suppose we start with with Miss Marple and um, 
and kind of move on from there. It does it does seem to suit slightly quieter, perhaps more feminine way of looking at things. Um, there are some great men. I mean, one of my favourites, who I would say is sort of cosy in the way that it's described now, is is Brother Cadfile. Um, you know, this male medieval monk who I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, um, and uh, Lord Peter Whimsey is my favourite of all. So, you know, very male as well. But yes, I mean, the ones, the books that I'm reading at the moment tend to have female protagonists, which is lovely. I'm all for celebrating that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of them. I have a real kind of guilty pleasure, joy of the monk books. You know, the from the TV show Monk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a whole series of books written with him in. And those are, and I mean, they're totally cosy as well. There's not really a lot of. I think there's more TV, maybe like Father Brown and stuff, but they're great. Yeah, I mean, I, I have Columbo at the top of my list, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite detectives of all time. Currently, Columbo <laughs> is right up there. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, if you think TV, there's maybe more more men and then in fiction, maybe more more female protagonists. Um, what do you like to read? Have you read... Can you, this is one of our favourite questions recently in the group, and we'll, I'll ask you it while we're in there and talking about the range of things. What have you read recently that you've really enjoyed? I'm reading at the moment um, The Birthday Girl by Sarah Ward, which is coming out, I think, in April. Uh, and it's so good. So if anyone in the group sees that when it when it comes out, they have to pick it up. I, I'm really lucky to have a proof of it, um, which my favourite, one of my favourite things about being an author is people send you books. Yeah, same. Sarah Ward's joining us for a chat about that in April. Oh, it's so it's honestly so good. Um, my we're we're editor. We're, she's got the same editor as me for that book. Um, so we're like, I'm like, wow, kind of sisters, really. Then aren't we? <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's so good. I'm not just saying that. It's really good. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to have to just go for a second. I think I have a child waiting outside my house, locked out, desperately trying to get in. <laughs> I'll be back in one minute. But um, in the meantime, a um, book that I've really um, enjoyed uh, recently uh, was, I think, called The Other Half. I'm desperately trying to think of the author, but it was absolutely lovely. And it's come out in the last kind of month or so. And I thought that was absolutely great. And there's one called Grave Expectations coming out in a couple of months time, which has a young female medium as, as the detective. Ooh. And I really Ooh. recommend that. I'll be back in a minute, sorry about this. Oh, really like every, time I do these, every time I do these events, I'm like, whenever someone says what they're reading, I write it down and then I go and look at it after. <laughs> I, mean, I was just like making a note of the Grave Expectations. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really good. Um, do you know I, I'm trying to read more this year but I do a lot of audiobooks as well because I drive to work in the morning and it's about I, I drive about an hour a day back and forth to work and that's like perfect audiobook kind of listening as well so um oh I'm back can you hear me yes oh good okay right are, um, are both of your books are, are your books available on audio both of you yeah yes. um the first book just came out uh, two weeks ago, I think. Do you get a say in who, who voices them? So I'm imagining, um, especially for Sophia, that who voices them is really important. Yeah, I've been really lucky. Um, I I have an audio in the UK and in the States, and the, the lovely reader in the States is British and has a British accent, which I think is so important, and she does some great books. Um, but in the UK, I have Samantha Bond, um, from Miss Moneypenny and Downton and all of those things. Uh, she's <laughs> absolutely wonderful. And I'm so grateful because the audiobooks get such high ratings and everyone's always <laughs> saying, you know, the way they're read is so lovely. And normally I hate hearing my writing because I always want to rewrite it. Um, but um, when she does it, I can actually listen to like a couple of chapters at a time <laughs> without thinking, no. Um, so, yeah, really thrilled with her. I feel the same. I feel it. I feel like it's better <laughs> than, than my writing. It's uh, Jenny Funnel who did um, As Time Goes By. Um, she reads it. And she's brilliant. It's just really. It's such a wide array of British accents as well. Um, it's just really good. I love. I love audiobooks anyway. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Mm. 
We have so, fun. Well, love or hate. Um, yeah, if I if I like the narrator, then they are my Sometimes favorite. I just don't, get, you just can't get on with it. Yeah. I don't know why. Sometimes I listen to something, and I th especially if it's a book I've read a lot, um, and then maybe the narrator's not quite how, what you had in your head. But not very often. <laughs> It's interesting with the Thursday Murder Club because I've just been listening to the, the latest one and of course they, they had to change narrator after the first two and I think that was really hard for people. I found it hard as well. Yeah, I yes, I got, I got used to Leslie cool. Manville and the way she did things and I, and I love the way she did the sense of humour. So yeah, I'm still adjusting there. I um, I've only read the first Thursday Murder Club book. I've got the second one to read but it's just not quite made it to the top of the pile yet. Um, well, I, I'm a big fan. I was from the start. I, I knew that he would write funny books and, and he has done. And I, I love the team that he's assembled. And I, I just love the way the li little jokes are, um, are kind of scattered through the book. Um, there was one about um, a doorbell that was some, it wasn't webyanycar.com, but it was something <laughs> like that. It was a, it was an advert that you know, and you could exactly picture what the doorbell was like. It's such a lovely little detail and it's full of things like that. So yeah, I love that kind of thing. I did really like the first one. It's just when you do the, these author chats, you end up with a reading list for them and you don't always. A miles long. Yeah. So book two is that waiting to be read. It's just. <laughs> I've not got there yet. <laughs> um, I feel like my pile's never ending; it's just expanding. Yeah, yeah same. I'm, um, I'm, I'm out of space I'm, for books. Been challenged to a no buying book march, or otherwise, my husband says one of us is going to die under a sliding book pile. It <laughs> 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 does the library count? You just have to go there instead. Yeah, I might do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do my my shout out for libraries that I do on a regular basis because a, a few people have said to me I, I'm so embarrassed but I borrowed your book from the library instead of buying it I hope you don't mind and I have to say to them I am so grateful I've probably got more money back from the scheme that runs it from you borrowing it than I would have done if you bought it on a discount somewhere yeah um, the PLR scheme it's, it's wonderful to amazing. know yeah, yeah it's, it's such a good way isn't it of, of doing them so I think it's a good message to get out there that authors aren't losing out by you doing that. Mm. Yeah, it's something I never knew about before I became an author. So I'm um, trying to tell everyone now. <laughs> like, please borrow from the library. Don't feel bad about it because still getting the payment. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's be better than charity shops. Yeah. Um, in which case, yeah, it's, it's great for the charity shops. But yes, we don't really know about that one. <laughs> So with the rising sort of love of cosy crime, um, has there been TV interest in either of your books? Can you tell us if there has? No. Oh, you're going to say something, Hannah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Not yet. I'd love that, but uh, no. <laughs> um, I have had. Um, but then, of course, my main character died and made everything a lot more complicated. Um, so they're hoping to work with the book that I'm writing now, which is book four in the series. So I need to write it first before they can do whatever they want to do. But they're a <laughs> wonderful company. So I really, really, really hope that they, they get to make a series out of it, because if they do, it will be absolutely brilliant. I think it'd be a really good series. I think. Yeah. It, yeah, definitely. I, I think they... It. I think they both would be because I kind of, I mean, yours, Sophie, is so different that it would make something really entertaining to watch. But then Marjorie and Clem are just so lovely <laughs> Thank yours, you. that I feel like I'd just go to watch them to see my friends. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of people <laughs> message me and say, like, oh, I just really love Marjorie and Clem and the team, and I feel like I could hang out with them. I think that's just so nice. Um, yeah. You thought yeah. them to be your dinner ladies, you know, you go and get a cup of tea or something with them. <laughs> Definitely. Do you find, Hannah, that if you if you set a scene somewhere real, that when you go there in real life, you sort of feel that that scene has happened there and it's all a bit disconcerting? I've kind of, so I kind of, all my town, I think, I've made it all fictional because I was like, I can do whatever I, if it needs to have a skyscraper in the middle of the town centre one day, then um, it's kind of, I can just put it in there, but it's very, if I don't know if you've ever been to Chepstow, that's where I grew up. And the whole so. town is very Chepstow. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
it's just like quite a little quaint pretty little town um but yeah and I kind of there's bits of it and people who live in Chepstow go oh that's the leisure center that is attached to the school and I'm like yeah <laughs> that's nice <laughs> under a fictional name <laughs> how does that affect your things though because I would imagine like a lot of authors like to go to sort of where their book is set and like do kind of you know events sort of based in the locations and things like that and you can't do that if you've made it up no no kind of you can't do it if it's Windsor yeah. Castle either you can't do it <laughs> in Windsor Castle either I was just <laughs> just I should have set it and I could have had like a free pass you know <laughs> But you could have your books in like the Windsor Castle gift shop. Yeah, my guess. Um, I yeah, I mean, I I've done a signing at the Windsor Windsor Castle Waterstones, the one kind of down the road. So that's that's really nice. Yes, I'm happy to do things sort of located <laughs> nearby. That's the best I can do, I guess. <laughs> you might um you might get an invite to the castle. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're making it famous. <laughs> That would be fun. I mean, a, a couple of people have taken photographs of the book from within inside the complex. So they're staying with somebody who lives there or works there or, or whatever. So that's really exciting. Um, and, I, and I did hear that um, there was a group that went into a bookshop, um, who, who a group of people who do work there, who were busy saying that it, it is a really accurate series. Um, and that was just really lovely to know because um, I didn't kind of set out to do that to start with. But but now I kind of challenge myself that if I can get it right, I do. Um, so it's nice to know that they they feel that I'm doing that. And, you know, already we're living in a in a post queen world where things are changing dramatically the way things are run. Um, so even though my books were only set like six years ago, um, they're already becoming kind of historical record, really, of, of how things worked. Although I have to say one, one change that I had to make was um, I cut out an awful lot of the type of people who work for the Queen, because otherwise I would have had a cast of about 150 characters <laughs> in the scene. And that was just like never going to work. So um, you've been asked a couple of questions coming in. So you've got how much of an impact has your own lives? have your own lives had on your characters and books? For me, um, quite a lot because, I mean, I got the idea because I grew up as an army child and my father was in the army and through that he met the Queen several times mm -hmm. and also we travelled around the world a bit. And so I do bring a lot of my, my sort of teenage experiences to to the way I write kind of understanding what it must have been like to lead quite a public life because there were times when my parents did that because of my father's job um so um yeah I mean I'm always bringing things in and I mean just you know in in general life if, if I'm I don't know if, if something really annoys me about what's going on in the world or something I find a way of kind of putting it in the books as well because it's quite cathartic so you wouldn't know necessarily that it was something in my life but you know characters say things and um as a result of things that, that have happened to me so yes it, it all finds its way in there one way or another yeah. I'm very similar I keep like <laughs> if you look at my notes app on my phone it's just things that I think are funny or things that have happened and I think oh that'd be really funny or silly to put it out in there I feel I've worked in a lot of uh, catering kitchens and the teams are usually quite close-knit and I think that's where the dinner lady team have kind of come from just from all the people I've met over the years because uh, you tend to work quite closely together I think it's a lovely thing about crime fiction and it's not just cozy crime actually because um Oh, I'm also thinking of The Botanist that I read recently. Yes. Is that by M.G. Craven? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, he, and he does the same thing, even though his books are so not cosy. But, <laughs> but the idea of a team coming together, of people who get on with each other and, and actually come under pressure together and deal with it really well and help each other out. Um, I, for me, that's one of the great pleasures of reading crime fiction of all kinds, actually. Um, and it's interesting with the book that I'm writing now, it's like a sort of origin story. So I'm writing about lots of characters who don't know each other very well yet and haven't worked together yet. And so it's working towards them, finding this kind of balance in their lives. Um, but um, I, I think I'll probably find the next book in this trilogy uh, easier to write because they'll all, they'll all know each other by then. They'll trust each other. The whole point of the book I'm writing at the moment is they don't trust each other at all. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they're not a gang yet. I feel like uh, as the series goes on, that as I'm writing it, um, 
yeah, it's, e it's easier because actually I, quite, I know all the characters now and they've all got their, even the side characters have got their own storylines kind of going on. And it's it's quite nice, actually. I think Cozy lends itself really well to um, like a long-term series. Yeah. You can come back to the same characters again and again and again. My kind of is, is what readers <laughs> enjoy so much as well. And it's, it's lovely to be able to sort of do that. Um, yeah, I think my readers are going to be really cross with me that um, because I'm going back in time, um, the sidekick character wasn't born in the in what I'm writing now. So that's a good excuse, though. <laughs> but I think that's the nice thing, isn't it, about a long running series? So I've just read the last Deli Griffiths book. I was interviewing her mm. earlier in this week, actually. And I'm really sad that it's kind of finished for now. There is Galloway like, ones. Yeah, and that's yeah. like a series that you've read for so long that you feel like the characters, when you're going back to them, are old friends. Mm. And again, like you said, with Mike and the Botanist, you've got that variety of different characters as well within that are quite interesting. Um, I'm going to go back to asking you some of these questions on here because there's so many good ones. Um, you've been asked if you've got a dream destination for a book launch or signing. Ooh, <laughs> interesting. I kept joking when when I was when we were talking about the books with the, the initially with the publisher. I kept saying I want to go to Australia and then I'm gonna do research and do Dinner Ladies Down Under. And they were like, No, <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> I now really I, love now to I really want to read Dinner Ladies Down Under. <laughs> 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 maybe maybe next time <laughs> um yeah i have some readers in melbourne who would who would love me to go and i i'm just like as soon as i can make this happen i am on yeah. a plane i would really love to do it but but yeah it hasn't happened yet that would be so good um if when i get to set a book, book at Mal, balmoral there's a really oh. lovely hotel uh nearby called the fife arms which is very very glamorous and expensive but very gorgeous and um, and I love the idea of doing some kind of event there. That would be really fun. Yeah, it's kind of on the doorstep of of where the Queen used to potter about. So yeah, I'd really enjoy that. I um I I've done two launches uh, for my first two books at Chapter Bookshop. So I'll probably just say Chapter Bookshop again. <laughs> There's uh, Matt who runs the bookshop. He he owns it. Um, he's just so lovely, and they always just supported me so much. Um. It's just I always have a really good time. So, yeah. That's what it comes down to in the end, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, one of my favourite experiences was I was in Oswest Street at Booker Books um, in the autumn. Yeah. And it was a wet November evening. And and I don't know, I mean, at least 30 people showed up for a QA, and a and it was just wonderful. And we just had a really, really lovely time together. And I mean, I would go back in a heartbeat. It was just <laughs> so nice. Yes. So, yeah, they're really special those times. Yeah, it's just funny. It's just not, it, and, and obviously, yeah, because I grew up in Chepstow, we used to, me and my sisters used to queue there for their Harry Potter launches and stuff at midnight. So it's just really bizarre. Oh, I'm doing an event here. <laughs> really strange. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So you, um, both your books are kind of very British as well, aren't they? You know, in that we've got mm. the ladies and the queen and things. What's the reception like? to them in different countries and um do you think like that that love of cozy crime is kind of a very british thing uh my experience is is no it isn't at all uh the french have a, a really thriving cozy crime market germany seems to as well um i've got a book coming out in denmark uh in next week um they they, they, they call it higger crema or something like that which i think is perfect <laughs> Um, Higger just fits it so well. I'd much rather be Higger than Cozy, I think. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it, it's thriving in America as a market as well. Oh, it's huge and, in America, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah it's, it's really interesting how international it is. Um, and with mine, I think it just obviously it depends on, on a country's um, relationship with the Queen a lot um, as to how it goes down. And often countries that did have a monarchy and now don't really seem to like my books there seems to be a nostalgia for, for that kind of thing I don't know I just find that really fascinating how about you Hannah um well it came out the first book's just come out in America actually in, over the summer so and I think it's done quite well 
exciting. Yeah, because obviously it is very different because it is very British. And I talk about like what's it's and I don't know, <laughs> Argos catalogues and um, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't really know what to expect, but yeah. Um, but obviously, cozy crime in America is absolutely huge. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Thursday Murder Club has done so well there. As yeah, well. I think. I mean, it's, it's British in very specific ways that you either it know what you're doing. It transcends that as a, because of the story, maybe. Yeah, and perhaps people, I mean, perhaps we sort of underestimate how much people love learning about other cultures. Perhaps they like yeah, to know about, you know, Tesco's finest and things. <laughs> <laughs> and Asda, car park and, yeah, yeah. all sorts of. <laughs> we have some um, really lovely American members in our group. And they um who who adore like British crime fiction, and they've even travelled over to like come to events. Oh, wow. oh how wonderful! Um, which is great, but it's just it's interesting, isn't it? That to see that sort of love of fiction across the globe is is great, and it must be nice when it's your book that people are kind of enjoying in all those different countries. Yeah, really exciting. There's nothing like kind of being in a bookshop somewhere, you know, really far away and then suddenly <laughs> seeing, I mean, like I was in Rome last year for something and one of my books was just, you know, in the local bookshop and that was amazing. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Wow. Did you like get a picture of yourself with it in Rome? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do that anyway. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I'm like... <laughs> yeah, what's Instagram for? Yeah. Not that. <laughs> Where's the best place someone's ever sent you a picture of themselves reading your book? Venice, I think. That was lovely. By, by a really kind of picturesque bridge, you know, doing it properly. That was really nice. Oh, I get a lot of pictures of uh, animals with books, <laughs> with my book. <laughs> like dogs that have destroyed the book cover. I don't know why. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, here's a review. The best review I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Um, you've been asked if you could have an access all areas pass to somewhere that you haven't been allowed to visit because of restrictions. Mm. Where would you love to have access to? Okay. Mm. Oh, that's difficult. <laughs> I mean, I would naturally say that, you know, the bits of Windsor Castle and Buckingham Palace that I, I didn't get to visit, but I kind of enjoyed making them up. And I feel like I've been there now because, <laughs> you know, I, I've created them in my imagination. So I, I'm not sure. I, I love the idea, the whole idea of the access all areas pass, though, definitely up for that. I just um, want that just for anywhere. But, but do you know what? Because I'm a chef. I would like to have one and I can just go look at other people's kitchens all day. Oh, I would like, come with you. <laughs> Love other people's kitchens, kitchens you know, just to see the differences. Because I do, if I, yeah, so if I make friends with chefs, I'm like, can I come and see your kitchen? I don't know why. I just enjoy looking at other commercial kitchens. Yeah, no, I can absolutely <laughs> imagine that. Yeah. You might get a little bit disappointed as well if you went sort of back into like you know the back parts of Windsor Castle and things like that and it wasn't the same as you'd made up well I know <laughs> I might just be <laughs> like, writing my books the whole time that would be terrible like, oh <laughs> I don't know I just I feel like if I'd like made it up and I was loving living with the characters and then doing that there and then I went and it was different I'd be like really sad you yeah, know, oh, this is just where they keep their wellies. <laughs> yeah. What I would love to do, which is never going to happen, is just hang out with Mike Tyndall and Zara Phillips for a day because they <sighs> both look like they are really good fun people to be they around. They do, don't they? They so, seem like yeah. they'd be a right laugh. Well, if they're what, what, great time. Time. <laughs> <laughs> what are you both working on at the moment? I've so just I'm... handed in. Oh, sorry. No, you, you go. Oh, you go. No, it's okay. Uh, I think I'm just, just looking because I thought there was a picture of it in this book, but maybe I imagined that. Um, I did imagine it. Um, I'm working on um, A Death in Diamonds, which is book four in the series. Um, and that's the one that goes back to 1957. Um, and so it opens in Paris and the Queen's on her first trip as Queen. She went there as princess before. Um, 
and she's uh, she's just mentioned that she hasn't seen the Mona Lisa, so they physically bring it to her, which they did do at the Louvre. Um, and she observes somebody kind of looking at her in a really kind of horrible way in the crowd, uh, and she realizes that something's up. And then, meanwhile, a couple are found dead in a muse house in Chelsea. That doesn't seem to have anything to do with the Queen, but um, <laughs> she rapidly realises she has to solve this murder because otherwise terrible things are going to happen. So that's what I'm up to now. Brilliant. What about you? Uh, I've just handed in book four to my editor, my long-suffering editor, Sean. And I'm last week and this week I've plotted book five. So I'm going to start that. Nice. Probably. Yeah. So how long did it take you to write? So the book four, I wrote that in three and a half months. Um, nice, that's nice and fast. Oh my God, that was, I shouldn't have done that to myself. I don't know why. I, <laughs> I was like, this is fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was very quick. Um, but I've got till December for five. So that's quite a long time, really. Oh, you write faster than me. I, I was really late with Murder Most Royal and it's amazing that it came out when it did at all. I feel um, like you, you've got to do so much research, though, you know, where I can kind of <laughs> pull things out of the air if I need to. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I should be able to write faster than I do, but I, I kind of agonise about it. Um, Are you a bit of a perf perfectionist with your writing? Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've taught writing for years and I always say to people, don't do not do what I do. You know, just, just write it. <laughs> a lot of people call it the vomit draft, which I hate, but it yeah. is just that, you know, get get it done. Get it down on paper. Finished. Yeah, you, you can't edit, edit nothing, can you? Done. Yeah, so I know what to do. I just don't do it. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm, saying, I'm saying I've handed book four in, but that doesn't mean that's that's not the final draft by any means. <laughs> that's just in. <laughs> yeah, but lo lovely for your editor to know that it's kind of... Yeah, yeah. so Charlotte will work her magic and then send it back when she's ripped it apart <laughs> into pits. I, I must say, well, I'm doing something I haven't done before with this one, which is I'm working with a with a writers group, and I'm I'm oh. testing the chapters on people as I go along, and they're being really lovely and supportive, and and so when I when I go, yeah, oh, we lost oh, no. Her Wi-Fi was doing so well. While we wait for her to unfreeze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, someone asked a really good question because she's asked about those Christmas scenes, especially yes. a, a cosy or golden age book. And she said, is there a time of the year that's enjoyable for you to write about? But I know you've got a Christmas book. Yeah, and I wanted to do that <laughs> because I love Christmas. Um, and I actually thought that was going to be easier than it was. But then actually um, I found out more difficult to write about I think because there's like a, a line isn't there where it has to stay really Christmassy to be the Christmas book that's true yeah you froze midway do you want to finish telling us what they're saying <laughs> oh your writers group your writers group Oh, writer's group. Oh, yeah. So I was just saying, so I've got this writer's group. And so when inevitably I think, no, 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 I'm on completely the wrong lines and it's all completely terrible. Um, I can remind myself that, no, my writer's group thought it was all right. And, and that is making me faster because I can yeah. just carry on. So, yeah, that's good. And then we, we were asking, so I asked Hannah about writing her Christmas book. And Sam asked that she said she enjoys the Christmas scene, but wondered if there was a time of the year that you really enjoyed writing about. Ooh. Um, well, my favourite time of the year is going back to school time, kind of September. I always used to love getting my pencil case ready and, you know, we're at sort of six, seven, eight and going to the stationery shop. It's really sad that Paper Chase is closing down now and what? hardly anywhere to buy stationery anymore. Um, Paper Chase isn't closing down, is it? Um, yeah, it really is. Yeah, I was there today because it was all 40% off. So I was busy buying all the stationery I could buy. Um, in a sad way, but um, so I love that time of year and I love writing about it and it suits, the, the Queen was had always been in Mount Balmoral and then she was kind of gearing up again. So my, uh, the finale of the, the book that I'm writing now is, is set in kind of October um, when a million people came out on the streets of New York to to greet her. Um, yeah, I love writing about it. And then, and then you've got the kind of run up to Christmas after that. So that that's my, in life and in fiction, my favorite time. I am a teacher, so I very much do not like back to school. <laughs> I can imagine. 
<laughs> but so like my, different <laughs> my very favorite festival that we do in our year because we have a christmas festival we call it winter fest it's how we finish our year um and it's sam's favorite who helped organize this one today but my favorite one is one we have on halloween or as near to halloween as possible and we call it spook fest book four is very halloween oh nice we're gonna yeah, yeah, that was really fun actually <laughs> You might get excited. A lot of fun stuff of Halloween. <laughs> I love it because our authors come and they tend to dress up and it's all very good fun. We get, you sort of bring out the the sort of fun in people by theming things a bit, I think. Um, so yeah, that's definitely my favourite. My favourite sort of time apart from Christmas. Um, <laughs> but I get yours with the sort of back to school time. Yeah, not mine. <laughs> yeah, no, <fair> <laughs> um, af, would you write a any spin-off stories about yours? So you've got a wide cast of characters in both of your books, haven't you? Would you attempt to write any spin-off stories? You've got a brilliant teacher that'd be a good one. You've got a sidekick who could have an origin story of. Yeah, I would love to do like the drama teacher's kind of interpretation of events because I feel like her version would be a lot more dramatic. <laughs> that sounds really fun to write. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I don't know if everyone would want to read it, but <laughs> to write it would be a lot more fun. Um, I want to do a, a, a novella kind of thing starring the Queen Mother um, when she was queen called The Most Dangerous Woman in Europe, which is what Hitler called her. So I've definitely got that up my sleeve. Um, and yes, Rosie, lovely Rosie. I want to write another novel with her at some stage because that's kind of been written in my head anyway. And, and I'd love to do um, spin-off things with her perhaps. Um, yeah, I like the idea of it, but I, I want to kind of really in a perfect world, I'd like to do at least 12 with the Queen in. So I'm the years away before I, um, I'm free enough to do other <laughs> things if it all goes well. Do you know where you're going to go with it for 12? Well, um, the 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 one the fourth one I want to do with Rosie set in 2017 would be the last one chronologically. So that's where the series would end chronologically. But in the meantime, as I said, I'm in 57 now and I definitely want to do 66, which is my birth year. And it was such a great year. Um, at, you know, the Beatles and Carnaby Street and Twiggy and all of that stuff going on. And then I want to do some in the 80s and some in the 90s. So, yeah, there's. Um, I, I sort of picture a, a collection of trilogies set in different decades, probably. Hi. I like that. Katie Watson has said she is desperate to read the Queen Mother novella. <laughs> desperate to write it. Yeah, she wore a white wardrobe. It was white morning. Her mother had just died. And she had this beautiful, colourful wardrobe that had been designed for her by Norman Hartnell. And, and it had been designed to go with all the places she was going to be. So her outfit would colour coordinate with wherever it was. And she couldn't wear it because she was in mourning. And, and everyone was thinking, if she wears black, you know, she's so tiny, she'll just disappear. So what could she do? <laughs> so they put her in white, which is a French, a, a tradition of French queens to wear, to wear white when they were mourning. And she looked fantastic. She wore these white crinolines and lace and things. And it was all made for her in about three weeks. And um, and it really inspired Christian Dior, who, you know, 10 years later was was making the new look. So, yeah, there's a lot to be said about a little tour. So, yeah, I want to do that. Cool. Um, one of my favourite questions to ask, and I, I kind of want to ask it for both of you, because you write such interesting books, is would you make a graphic novel version of one of your books? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm not talented enough to do that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, mean, I love graphic novels like *Viva Vendetta*. Come on, that would be amazing. But yeah, but yeah, me personally, I could not do that because I cannot draw. <laughs> exactly the same. You know, I've got two sons who are really big fans of graphic novels, and I, and I, I grew up on Asterix and kind of yeah, you know, the... of it back in the day, and I adored it. Just adored it. So yes, in a heartbeat. Brilliant. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. Sam has asked if there's any, she said she asked the authors in an earlier panel if there's anything they've gone too far over the line with and had to change to keep it cosy. Have you had to change anything? Violence-wise, no. 
Pardon? Violence wise, no, it's always been right. I, I may have to with the one I'm writing now. I can imagine my editor going, do you know what? <laughs> it has to happen the way it happened because it just has to, but I, I might not be able to to describe it in quite the level of detail that I've gone into. <laughs> we'll see. I um yeah, I think something's gonna come back from when the edit comes back for four that I'm she's gonna ask me to tone down or maybe cut it out. I've added a prologue that's quite grim. Um, and I don't think it needs it, but I was I'll leave it in anyway. <laughs> the word count, you know, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I think most of the time, like I had this whole thing cut from the third book, which was just about the cats and it was too cozy. And so I think maybe I've gone the other way with it. I, I had a friend, uh, a fellow writer, I, I was asking her when I was writing book two that's right I, I was sort of telling her the way the plot was evolving in my head and it it, it involved um a cat killer um oh, yeah. and she said you can't kill cats you just can't and oh. I thought okay I won't then so I, <laughs> I did genuinely change it uh, that didn't happen um and actually somebody said that I should have a trigger warning in book three because it mentions one of the corgis dying because it it, it died at that time and I, I thought it was really interesting you know books my, our books are read by cat lovers and dog lovers and i i respect the fact we have to be really careful about that fair enough there is a whole website where you can look it up is there yeah. well like does the dog die yeah wow I so. you're like yeah i can i because yeah. i keep threatening to kill people in the books to my wife and go go i'm gonna kill blah blah and she's like no and then <laughs> but i couldn't kill one of the cats <laughs> yeah isn't that it's funny thing yeah it's so funny but yeah, people will, we've had people comment in the group about it. People will stop reading if an animal dies. No, I put too much of the cats in the book and I had to take loads of it out. I had, the neighbour was looking after the cats while they were on holiday and she kept taking them away places and they were looking at this cat camera they'd got set up, confused, where have they gone? And it turned out she was entering them in a cat contest. <laughs> and then my editor was like, no, no <laughs> murder. It just solved the murder. So it's all gone. Oh, well, I'll just keep shame. that though. I'll keep that in a Word document for something. I can go on your website as, you know, special material. Yeah, on the blog or something, you know. Or in like a little collection of stories or something. Like that's going on an adventure. Some mad, like, that had like the 15-year-old elderly cat win the cat competition that was going oh. on. But no, cut it. <laughs> she was right to cut it. <laughs> you think there is like a... A limit. I mean, I'm interested because you started yours with someone sort of essentially looking like they'd done autoerotic asphyxiation. So you can go to sort of quite dark places. But do you think there are limits to what you can do if you're sort of trying to sit it in the cosy space? I. Well, I mean, if you had if you had a serial killer who went around doing really, really horrible things. I think just how whether or not you described it, I think it just kind of wouldn't be cosy. Um, so I, yes, I suppose there are limits, and and I do read the the back of some novels and think, whoa, my god, you know, the, <laughs> like it, it's the most painful form of tattooing that has ever been known, and this person uses it as a form of torture. And I think, nope, not going to read that. Definitely not going to write it. Um, so yes, I guess there probably are limits, but 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 they're not they're not quite as gentle as some people perhaps might think. I mean, I think you, you can have a, a murder that is pretty horrible when you think about it. I mean, actually, one that I always talk about is murder at the vicarage. No, the body in the library. Yes. The, 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 the real murder, the, the sort of back murder and the body in the library is absolutely horrible when you think about it. But you only find out about it really late in the book. And and again, it's sort of, you know, it's not exactly glossed over, but it goes over quite quickly. Um, but it's really nasty. And, you know, in a, in, a, in a thriller that chose to really focus on that, it would be a very, very horrible killing. So, um, yeah, they're, they're not all just sort of um, somebody just falling down a stepladder or something, but although that would be pretty bad, too. <laughs> what about you, Hannah? What do you think? Is there a limit? Or? I haven't found it yet. I think <laughs> I'm going to keep writing... I don't know, because the one in book four is pretty grim. But then again, I think it's how you, as you're saying, Sophia, how you build it up and how it's written in a way. Yeah, sense. 
I mean, I, when I was teaching YA writing, I would go back to Goodnight, Mr. Tom. And, you know, that there is a scene in that which, again, when you think about it, is absolutely horrific. But but it's it's written in a way that children can um, can identify with. Yeah. And they can take as much or a little from it as they want to. And I think Cozy does that a lot. I must say, I did read one recently um, where somebody had been kind of held hostage for a long time underground. And I just thought, even though, again, it wasn't like, in massive detail, but it, it just it didn't feel quite appropriate. Maybe the line is torture. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I guess as well it is how much is off off camera almost or out of the sight of the people reading, if that makes sense. I think yeah. you can get away with more by taking yeah. it away. So you're not sometimes... it in detail. Sometimes cozy is more about the puzzle and solving yeah, definitely. the puzzle than what's happened. I always think it's a lot about the characters as well. So I think yeah. you can have more of the kind of character relationships and their the yeah, and their lives and things. Yeah, and their lives, which is what draws me to it as a reader. I think. Yeah, I mean, I um, one of my the books I sort of come back to a lot is Busman's Honeymoon by Dorothy Sayers, um, and. And the murder in that is incredibly straightforward when, when you look at it backwards. Um, but um, but the characters and the you know these people have just got married and the relationship between them is what was really interesting her I think and then and that's what she really focuses on and um, uh, yeah that's what kind of drives that one through. Whereas there are other ones of hers that, again as you say that they're much they're much more about the actual puzzle um, and. Uh, and they can be incredibly intricate. Yes, and then, you, I mean, I, I suppose you can find that a cosy detective can be quite callous sometimes because they're really, really yeah. enjoying the puzzle and they're not yeah. quite so worried about the death that's going on in, in the process. How do you how do you plot your books? Do you kind of know who who done it? I always do. Yeah, I, I always start off with I know who done it and why um, and how, and then I have to work backwards and introduce my red herrings. You red herrings and. Yes, yes, it's 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 very much a working backwards process. <laughs> How about you? I um I tend to know, <laughs> and then sometimes it may change because I'm very much like a write and see what happens. Yeah, and then when I get to the end, I'll go back and make sure that it makes sense because sometimes I go off on a tangent with someone else, or I've introduced a new character, and yeah, um, I'm not really a plotter. It's terrible. It's a curse. I've started to plot a lot more than I ever used to um but yeah I, I find the plotting kind of carries me through because when I have my my many moments of oh my god this isn't working you know but if I've got the plot <laughs> me, I think well no it is working I just have to do this this chapter now in which this happens I so, kind of have yeah, like I'll do a four act where I say yeah. what I want to happen in each act and then I'll just be like okay go and then see where it goes <laughs> it doesn't always work but do you think some of the, the the sort of slight issue with cozy crime as well is that it's sort of introducing the crimes to your people because you don't want it to make it look suspicious. Do you know what I mean? You worry about Miss Marvel, don't you? I worry now with the series. That... Body, like yeah. to make it reasonable that your person would stumble upon a crime. I feel like with the with a series as well, because you have to introduce new characters because obviously you need new people to die. <laughs> and <laughs> and then is it too obvious who's the murderer if you've introduced do you know do you know what I mean mm. um but then on the other hand I don't know you kind of know the characters so it's quite nice as well yeah I mean I haven't had the problem yet of introducing murder I mean I do have that issue you know if, if we don't know that the queen's a detective um she can't be constantly surrounded by no. murder. <laughs> but I do quite like the fact that in in my my fictional world she actually kind of is but each time it's explained away. And if you look back, you know, there are lots of people who have accidents or unfortunate heart attacks or whatever it is, but that's what the public get to see. Um, so you don't know that these things have been happening kind of in the background. And with this Chelsea one that I'm doing now, there's no obvious link to the queen. So yeah, she's happy for it to stay that way. I think with the queen as well, there's so many people around her that it's more likely she might see something like that really. Yeah. yeah, it's probably a bit easier than for you where you've got your because it's in quite a small village, yours as well, I would imagine. So it's yes, so 
Yeah, let's see how it goes. <laughs> I think I think Midsummer Murders has helped all of us because yeah. you know the, the public now accepts that there is a town effectively in Somerset or a village. But when people just, just die awfully, <laughs> yeah, all the time, yeah. <laughs> dozens of people have died. Everyone's fine with that. Yeah, <laughs> we all just, all just accept it. That's like I'm going to have to stay in Chicago or somewhere, doesn't it? It's like ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, that's the one thing I always think about when I'm reading them, because I'm like, there must be like a point where it sort of gets to the point where you can't keep introducing like a crime with your people, which is a shame because then like you would lose those characters. I've got a plan. I've got a plan for the last couple. Oh, nice. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good plan. We'll find out. <laughs> 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 We've got about five minutes left. Oh, no. Um, so tell us about any other upcoming events you have. I'm going to be at Lime Crime, which I'm very excited Ooh. about. Um, and I have an event in the summer that I'm also very excited about that I can't talk about at the moment. Um, and then I've got the paperback of Murder Most Royal coming out in the summer, which will be great. Um, although it has a massive picture of a Christmas turkey on it, so um, I don't think we'll kind of buy it then and then just read it six months later. My Christmas book came out in August as well, so it was oh, very okay. like, it's a Christmas tree. People, people watch this, it's like a movie channel that shows Christmas movies in like July. Excellent. I like watching Christmas movies from about October. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. In October this year, it was really bad. Um, I did a podcast this morning that I can talk about later. Ooh. Yeah. And then um, book four, I think, is going to come out end of this year or early next year. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Brilliant. And then for the benefit of the people watching, just reminders of your book and what you've got coming out and things like that so they know what to go and buy. Maybe where the best place is to start reading as well, if they're new. Well, with, with me, it's The Winds Are Not is where it all starts, um, available from all good bookshops. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's where we first find out about the, the Queen's detecting abilities. And then the second book is called A Three Dog Problem in the UK. And it, the same book is called All the Queen's Men in America. Um, and then the third book in both countries is called Murder Most Royal, but it hasn't come out in America yet. And you, Casey? Oh, Hannah, sorry. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? I'm reading the thing. <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, I've written the Dinner Lady Detective series, um, which starts with the Dinner Lady Detectives. That's the first one. Um, and then An Unfortunate Christmas Murder. And then the newer book is uh, A Terrible Village Poisoning. Um, it is a series, but you can read them as a standalone if uh, you just pick one up one day. Yeah, same here. I think most people try to write them a bit like that now, don't they? So yeah, that you yeah. definitely. As a standalone as well. You, you don't want to ruin it. It's hard, actually, because you don't want to ruin it for people if they did want to go back and read the other ones. <laughs> Can't get yeah. too much in there. One of those other really tricky things being added on, isn't it? To you yeah. as an author as a challenge, how you do that. And it must, I reckon that's probably one of your most difficult things to do. Yeah, I, yeah, I enjoy the, the very, very sort of gentle callbacks to, to earlier books. But yeah, I, I very much try and make sure there aren't spoilers. Um, just, I mean, for example, in the, in the third book, um, in the second book, the Queen's private secretary um, gets a lot of credit for solving the crime. And, and the third book alludes to that a lot. But the readers are, are very clear that he didn't actually do anything useful at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that I put little bits in so if you have read all of them it's like it's nice little callback yeah that's good um thank you so much for joining us both of you it's been a fascinating hour with both with you and i've enjoyed hearing so much about your book thank you, thank you so much sorry i froze but anyway it's lovely to <laughs> <laughs> technical issues happen it's fine thank you very much